Okay, Joel, are you ready? Okay. All right. Welcome everybody to the uh, to the council meeting of uh, July 14th, 2020. I'm going to explain just for a moment what the protocol will be for tonight. In the order for face coverings, we did make some provisions for separate policies for how court is operated and how council is operated. So tonight, while council members are at their seats and facing forward, they are at a sufficient distance and they will be allowed to remove their mask to speak. Anybody in the audience who does come up to speak for public comments or makes any presentations will be uh, also allowed to remove their mask while they speak and we ask that you put that mask back on when you return to your seat and, and, and are seated. Okay, that being the case, we have uh, a special uh, guest tonight, our city attorney, uh, could not be here, so we have Avery Jackson filling in. Thank you. And as has been the custom uh, since I became mayor, we have a special guest who will give a, the invocation uh, and then lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I want to recognize those uh, two individuals first, and then we will we will move forward. So, uh, given the invocation tonight, will be Pastor Steve Swafford. He's in the audience. Uh, and Pastor Steve Swafford grew up in Cedartown, Georgia. He graduated from Cedartown High School in 1972. He answered the call to preach as a junior in high school and began pastoring a month later in June of 1971. After graduation, he went to Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, where he received a Master of Divinity degree with a minor in history. In July of 1974, that's the year I was born, he enrolled at Luther Rice Seminary in Jacksonville, Florida, where he finished a doctor's degree in theology. Pastor Swafford married Melinda Shaw, also from Cedartown, in 1976. They have three children, all who graduated from Villarica High School. In his 49 years of the ministry, Pastor Swafford has pastored churches in Georgia and Alabama and is presently pastor of Fullerville Baptist Church in Villarica, where he has served for the past 24 years. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, in just a moment, I'll ask you to come up and give the invocation. And then followed by that, we have Mr. Donald McCain uh, with us tonight. Donald McCain has been married to Stephanie Wright McCain for four years and has one son, Melson, who is married with two children. He is retired and a member of Mount Prospect Baptist Church, where he is a volunteer in the community food bank and sings in the male chorus at the church. Mr. McCain received a certificate of honor for his honorable service in the United States Marine Corps as a Lance Corporal. He is also the brother of our distinguished councilwoman, Ms. Shirley Marchman. So if everyone would rise, Pastor, would you come up to the podium and lead us in the invocation? And then I will ask Mr. McCain to come forward. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. And Father, we are reminded of what David the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And Father, we come to you today thanking you for life and for health and for strength. Thanking you, dear Lord, for all of your benefits, all of your blessings. Everything that we have is because of you, and we thank you for that. Lord, we come right now especially on behalf of this council meeting tonight, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd bless our mayor, bless our councilman, bless each one that takes part in public discussion here tonight. We ask you, dear Lord, for wisdom and, Father, for leadership and for understanding for all of us. And, Lord, most of all, through that wisdom, we ask for some common sense as well. We ask you, dear Lord, that you bless our our uh, city as a whole, every aspect, every department. Father, we thank you for our police department, our chief. And Lord, we pray that you protect them in these uncertain times and these scary times as well. We ask you, dear Lord, that you just go with us through the rest of this day. Lord, help us to be faithful to you and serving you. And Lord, giving you the honor and the praise for all of the benefits that you have sent our way. And Father, for what you do for us, we'll be careful to give you the praise for it because I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, sir. Mr. McCain, if you would come forward to the podium and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please, sir. Good afternoon. Salute. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individually, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. You all may be seated. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, let's see what we have next. Ceremonial presentation. So earlier tonight we did uh, some pictures and now we will recognize employee anniversaries. And first up will be Miss Tara Ivey, in the Recreation Department for 20 years of service. I will ask uh, Mr. Tom Barber to present this and to uh, recognize Miss Ivey. We didn't get to do this, so this is a, a meeting late. So not everybody here knows Tara, right? <laughs> a lot of you do, but not everybody. I would Three, yeah, not three. Tiny, tiny, barely tiny, barely tiny, then the mayor, and then Vicki. Mm -hmm. 20 years. I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. But what she has done in that time is to hold that operation together through changes in philosophy, through good and bad economic times, multiple mayors, all without any fanfare not coming here and making a big splash about what's going on but getting that job done and i can't tell you as a city manager what that's worth to the organization or to the department so 20-year certificate and let's all give tara a hand for her service you want to say something? Oh, come on. all right thank you tara Hold on to that. We're going to give it to Mike, to the chief. we on the podium. Next up is a presentation by the chief uh, for Jason Miller for 20 years of service. So Jason was here when I got here. I came almost 15 years ago, and Jason was with us then, and he's, like uh, the mayor said, he's been with us 20 years. Uh, Jason's a soldier, and, and I mean that in the, the best way you can say it. Jason was a Marine. Uh, Jason has been a cop for a long time, and he's one of those guys that you never have to worry about. You just say, hey, Jason, I need this, this, but it gets done. And, and he's just all, always been that way. He's always been straight up. I don't ever have to worry about him fussing about this or complaining about that. He, he does his job. And... And we appreciate him and what he's done. 20 years in Villarica is a long time. And especially to be a police officer in today's time, it, it, it takes a lot. And we appreciate him, uh, his wife Jennifer, and, and, and uh, all that they do for our, our department. So congratulations, Jay. Can I get that? Thank you, Jason. Okay, go ahead. Give him a Jason's been here for a long time, and I appreciate all the work you've done, and I've seen him over the years as well, even though I haven't been here that long. Okay, so next up is a gentleman who needs no introduction. He is probably uh, one of the most famous walkers in town, along with the chief, Scott Parker, who has been with us for 25 years. Scott, come forward and let the chief recognize you. So... 
like he said, everybody knows Scott. Scott's been here. He was here uh, when I came, and he's been an integral part of me being successful. Uh, he's he he and a couple others, Hunter and and Chaddix, are like my right hand folks. If if we make a decision, it's a group decision, and and we all bring different aspects to the job, and and we discuss it as a group. And the one thing about Scott is I always know he's gonna shoot straight with me. He's not gonna tell me. You know, he's not going to tell me what I need to hear. He's going to tell me the truth. He's going to tell me what, what really needs to be done, and, and I appreciate that in him because I know who he is all the time. Uh, I appreciate the job he does, uh, how hard he works for the department. Uh, 25 years is an outstanding accomplishment. You should be very proud of that. We're proud you're a part of our department. We're proud of all you do for us, and, and we appreciate it. Uh, and his kids are here, Zoe and Maddie. Uh, and uh, they're kind of proud of them, they said. But uh, anyway, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Well, Chief, you can't go too far because uh, you're up again. It's now time for you to uh, present the dedication of the annual police report. So we do this every year. This is our annual report that we do for the department. Uh, I started this when I came, and, and every year we, we dedicate it to somebody special. Uh, and we decide this usually the first of the year. And, and this year we were talking about it, trying to decide who to, to, to dedicate it to. And the person that we're dedicating it to has no idea. Uh, most of the people here don't know, uh, just our department. Uh, but like I said, this was something that we decided a long time ago and I want you to understand what this person means to us in the police department what this person means to the city uh, all the way around this city how well known this person is I like watching y'all look around trying to figure out who it is uh, but uh, it, it's a huge a huge uh, honor for us to be able to do this so tonight we're gonna recognize Miss Shirley Marchman as our dedication. You had no idea. Why do you think we had this gentleman here tonight? And this gentleman here tonight. Uh, Mr. Miss Marchman's husband's here, Willie, and we appreciate Mr. Willie. Uh, but Miss Marchman, this year the Villarica Police Department would like to dedicate our annual report to Mrs. Shirley Marchman. Miss Shirley. as she is affectionately known, is dedicated to the cities and the employees of the city. And is a great, great proponent of the police department. Ms. Shirley McCain Marchman was the first African-American female elected to the city council in 1990 and has served continuously to the present minus four years that she gave up to run for mayor. She followed in her father's footsteps as he was the first African-American to serve on the council from 79 until his death in 1986. She has also served as the mayor pro tem for six years. Miss Shirley always stands out in a crowd with her smile and gentle, loving nature. We at the Villarica Police Department wanted to know that her presence, work, <laughs> and dedication are appreciated with helping us reach our targets and goals. Ms. Shirley is one that will always stand up for what she believes and supports our officers and employees like we're one of hers. Thank you, Ms. Shirley.
All right, congratulations. This is really my baby. They, I love them. Anything they want, I'll stick my finger up and pencil or whatever. <laughs> they know they can depend on me to go for whatever. Yes, for some liquor. Baby, Next time y'all are asking the question whether I can keep a secret or not, now you know. She really didn't know. Okay. Now that we've got those out of the way, uh, let's move on to the adoption of the agenda. So, uh, Council, you have the agenda before you. Uh, we are going to make a slight change to F, um, Community Development. We will not consider the adoption of the uh, zoning map tonight. However, we will have the public hearing. So we will strike uh, F1B and C tonight. Are there any other changes by any other council member? If not, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? So moved. I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended and a second. All in favor? That is unanimous. Okay, with that, we now have an agenda and we will uh, move forward to council updates. I am going to take just a moment to talk about um, these face coverings and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this and then I'm gonna recognize the council uh, if anybody has any comments. But the order itself lays out uh, the best rationale that we have and I'm just going to read from the CDC that is really the only place I take information from I know that there are agendas somewhere uh, they are not mine mine is simply about protecting the employees in the city of Villarica and that is a special duty that we have here and while this may not be 100% uh, effective it may not be 50% effective I don't know what I do know is it seems to be the only thing that has any chance of slowing the spread of this virus, and that's why we're doing this. Um, with that said, I'm going to just read this paragraph from the, from the CDC, and then I'll ask, uh, I'll allow for council updates. Uh, why it is important to wear a face uh, cloth covering. Uh, this is directly from the CDC's website. Cloth face coverings may help prevent people who have COVID-19 from spreading the virus to others. Wearing a cloth face covering will help protect people around you, including those at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 and workers who frequently come into contact with other people. Cloth face coverings are most likely to reduce the spread of COVID-19 when they are widely used by people in public settings. The spread of COVID-19 can be reduced when cloth face coverings are used, along with other preventative measures, including social distancing, frequent hand washing, and cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces. That didn't say it was perfect. That didn't say it was 100% guaranteed. It said it may. And there are no other mays that I'm aware of. That being said, do any council members have any updates tonight? Mr. Young. As I stated during the July 9th City Council work session, I am strongly opposed to the mayor's executive order that became effective Monday, July 13th. Let me make one thing perfectly clear. I consider the mayor a personal friend, and I believe he is doing a great job leading Villarica during difficult times. We very often agree on a wide range of subjects pertinent to the current and future well-being of Villarica. I will also state that I understand the rationale and the intent of the mayor's executive order and applaud his desire to protect city employees. I just disagree with the methodology chosen. In support of my position, I have provided the mayor and city council members with informational articles from a variety of sources revealing the faulty premise of face mask science. I hope everyone remembers in March and April, Dr. Fauci, the Surgeon General, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Centers for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization all stated that masks would not protect you and did not recommend wearing masks for individuals without symptoms unless they were caregivers to those infected. 
Then the experts changed their tune. Now they highly recommend masks to, to everyone. Why? What happened? Did the facts that we have known for the last 10 years about respirators and masks change? No. Did the facts about the transmission of viruses change from what we have known? Remember, the common cold is also a coronavirus, and influenza has been with us for decades. No change. So what did change? The politics, not the science. And then Dr. Fauci and the Surgeon General tried to explain their flip-flop by saying that their original statements were made to ensure that masks were available to medical personnel. Really? So a given class of individuals were more worthy of protection than a normal guy like me. Really? The explanation does not pass the smell test. The experts have either lied to us or been mistaken over and over. We should trust them now based on their record. I am present here tonight with a mask on, or will be shortly. I have no desire for my disagreement with the mayor to cause a spectacle or to feed the next news story. I am here because the city has important business to conduct and my absence would be a failure of my responsibility to discharge my responsibilities to the citizens in my ward that want Villa Rica to be the city they would like it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Any other council members? Not so much an update, but just a, another personal thank you. This must be the anniversary night of all the really longtime veterans. Uh, Tara, 20 years, what can we say? And um, Officer Miller, Semper Fi, Scott Parker, 25 years. Wow. Thank you. Thank you from me. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir, Mr. Montahan. I just want to say, glad to see everybody's back again. We're getting back to normal, though adjusted. It is a new adjusted normal. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Mr. Carter, Ms. Marchman? Okay. So, uh, Mr. Young, I want to thank you for those comments. As I said at the work session, I appreciate varying views, and I appreciate that uh, you and I are friends, and we all on this panel are friends. Uh, and we all do work together. We do have disagreements from time to time, but that's to be expected. We all don't have the same histories and the same backgrounds. We're not all informed uh, in the same way. That's not just on this matter. It's on a host of matters that come before the city. So, sir, I, I want you to know that I appreciate the comments you made, and I respect your view as well. Okay, that uh, will take us to the um, public comment section. Thank you, ma'am. So let me just read uh, out here for just a moment. I, this is a new uh, format that we have for public comments. And I'm just going to read the, uh, because I, we, sometimes we, we've had some situations that uh, were not ideal here. So we've changed the, uh, the, the uh, comments that I'll make before we introduce these folks. Please keep your comments on a professional level. We will not accept comments that are considered by the chair to be of a personal attack on any individual or group of individuals. If you deviate from this protocol, you will receive a warning. If you deviate a second time, you'll be asked to leave. Only one person speaks at a time, and I will call your name and ask you to come up to the podium, and if you choose to remove your mask to speak, that's perfectly fine. Just ask that you put it back on when you go uh, back to your seat. Mr. Randy Simpkin. Madam Clerk, go ahead. Uh, my name is Randy Simpkins. I reside at 150 Gold Dust Trail in Carrollton, Georgia. Um, I was uh, here originally. Uh, I have interest in a few items on the consent agenda, uh, but I saw the public comment sheet and I thought I would take a minute just to introduce myself. And uh, I just recently bought a piece of property here for the first time, so I'm excited to be part of this community. Um, it's, uh, it's over in the Fullerville area at 627 Rockmart Road. You may recognize it by that big water tower. It's an old building. So um, we're excited about being partners, and I've been doing some research on your, uh, your comprehensive land use plans and 
looking at some of the historical um, recreational type directions that you're going. So I just wanted you to know I'm, I'm glad to be a neighbor, I'm glad to be in this community, and I look forward to working with the mayor and council members in any way. Well, thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Robert Walker. Hello, sir. Hi, Mayor. Please state your address for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Uh, and, and I am actually wanting to speak on the public hearing for the zoning and uh, uh, zoning map. And that, zoning there will be an opportunity for that a little later if you don't want to speak right now. Uh, if I will have Either an way. opportunity then, I will I You will. will we will still do that. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joel Morris. Mayor, I'm also here for that. Thank you. Good to see you, Joel. I haven't seen you in a long time. I didn't recognize you with the mask on. Okay, uh, Dennis Brown. Hello, sir. Hey, Gil. How are you doing? This is one of those we're glad to see back. We haven't <laughs> seen a lot of our public. Uh, in and a few I don't months. have a gripe. That no makes gripe. It even better. That's even better. Dennis Brown, 2717 Mariner Way, uh, here in Villarica. No, it's not a gripe in, in view of Tom's. Uh, glowing comments which I agree with about Tara it also seems maybe a little bit uh, uh, counterproductive but nevertheless my concern is with the fall recreation program and also with the vacant department head of the rec recreation department yes sir. Uh, and I'm concerned for a variety of reasons first uh, because of the source of information that you're going to use to make a decision on the fall recreation program and second, because of the image of the city as a good place for young families to live uh, without that department head position. First, no question that you as mayor and the council should make the decision about whether or not it's in the best interest of our citizens and youth uh, to allow a schedule of fall recreation activity programs based on health and safety uh, reasons. I only ask that the decision be made on the basis of Villarica statistics and not that of the state of Georgia High School Athletic Association or the state. Both of the latter reflect statewide concerns, and frankly, I don't think our neighbors residing in Villarica should have decisions on their activity made because of what's going on in Savannah or Macon or Albany or Dalton, for that matter. Second, two major reasons given for young families being attracted to an area are, also, are always schools and recreation opportunities for their children. I understand the city has little control over the schools, but city rec programs are another matter, and strictly it's pure purview. I admit to having a personal axe to grind because I lost my youngest child and her three children from Villarica for exactly those two reasons. In fact, just traveled 100 miles today to play around the golf with my two grandchildren. I'd much prefer to play locally. <laughs> Frankly, that's also a major reason I volunteered to be a member of the Villarica Recreation Advisory Committee. Not fulfilling uh, the recreation or even advertising for the recreation department head, I think, gives a signal that recreation is not a priority of the city. Disappointing to say the least, uh, like any first impression, a turnoff for young families looking for a place to relocate, or for that matter, current young families that are already here. Uh, and finally, regarding the latter, I seriously request that the visionary challenges that should be among the top responsibilities of you as our city officials, uh, a decision be made on just what type of community we wish to target. We cannot be all things to all people. More specifically, towns identifying themselves as tourist attractions or senior citizens, or senior centers or young family centers or industrial are but four examples of the more easily made decisions on your part about zoning and other policies regarding the city. You can't please everyone. I was buoyed by a member, when I was a member of the RSVP study program a few years ago, that the city was going in the right direction insofar as taking a first step on the voyage. I'll, I'll I'm give there you 30 listen. more seconds. Right. Go ahead. I'm just wrapping up. But unfortunately, I see a little follow-up for that matter, or even reference to the recommendations of the study. I know we have our problems to deal with, but I really <laughs> urge you as a council, okay, to talk not only about the little operations issue you deal with all the time, purchases and infrastructure. Let's talk about the future. Let's talk to the public about the vision that we would like to have for our city of Villa Record. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay, next up uh, would be an, another old friend, John Hannaback. Please uh, give us your address and uh, you have three minutes, sir. Good to see you back. 
Glad to be here. You seem um, to have a new mustache. I didn't see that in the, <laughs> the paper. The, ma the mask covers that up. So uh, I've got a birthday coming up, and that may be the time when it disappears, too. So, uh, how, how old will you be, John? You really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know, but sometimes I forget. 88. 88. So for those who don't know, John was also on the front page of the Villarican last week because he is our uh, Korean War vet here. Serving on the St. Paul, USS St. Yes, Paul. Paul. Right. Thank you for your service. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my, my reason for being here tonight is really primarily to give some thanks. Um, I want to thank very much, um, Mayor, for your ordinance on the masks and the distancing. Uh, appreciate that ordinance because I frankly felt a little uncomfortable at the work session when people were not wearing masks. And I want to thank Michael Young, uh, my councilman, for uh, complying with that. And I appreciate your comments tonight, but um, thank you for wearing the mask. I do appreciate that. Um, also want to thank Ken Denny, uh, the um, author of the article that you referred to, Mr. Mayor. Um, just for reminding us that no wars are forgotten. And I very much appreciate that. And lastly, I want to thank Chief Mansour and the Villarica Police Department. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your dedication. And thank you for the service to our community. And I salute you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> OK, thank you. and. I appreciate all those comments. I, I, I mentioned at our last meeting that I couldn't wait till we got back to, to having the public. Uh, you should. <laughs> Would anybody else like to speak? Miss Jody Mount, please state your name and address for the record. Jody Mount, 214 Rockmart Road here in Villarica. And um, I'd like to thank um, the mayor for enforcing the smoking ordinance. I look forward to be able to go in somewhere and play pool. I can't go in there because it stinks. It smells horrible. Um, I would love to play trivia, but there's no place that I can go because it smells horrible. So thank you for enforcing the law. And I also think that's going to make more respect for our other laws. Because if you don't, you, you be picky and choosy about, oh, I don't like this one, let's not enforce that. That, that creates disrespect for all our ordinances and stuff. So thank you. And I also want to um, piggyback on what Dennis said, too. Um, yes, we are dealing a lot with this new COVID virus and stuff, but please, let's not forget our vision. Let's not forget our future. You know, I'm volunteering working on the uh, pollinator garden over in Carrollton. I would love to be working on the pollinator garden here in Villarica on our own trail. You know, let's get things going, folks. Thank you. Thursday Thank you. night at La Fiesta in the public's parking lot. Trivia. No smoking. No smoking. Okay. Johnny's on Monday night. <laughs> Y'all can write that down and put it on your Facebook so everybody knows where they can go for trivia. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, do we have anybody else would like to make any comments tonight? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Who I did you? not recognize you at oh, all. Oh, that's right. I've curled my hair. Ha ha. I'm incognito here. Please uh, state your name and address for the record. Okay. And you got three minutes or less. Uh, okay. Prissy, <laughs> Prissy Sullivan, 207 North Avenue. Uh, I had two things. I also wanted to thank the mayor for enforcing the no smoking ordinance, uh, especially walking downtown, waiting in lines uh, to get in a store, and if any place thinks it might hurt their business, they might be surprised. It might help their business. Um, also, Jody, uh, Johnny's Pizza on Monday night has trivia if they can ever get it started back. And I also wanted to thank Chief Mansour and the police department. Uh, COVID-19 hit before I could get over here and say thank you, but we had a break-in in our car one night uh, around mid-March 
the response was fantastic, although I did try to call the police department. They referred me to 911, who didn't have a clue where I lived. But anyway, the police got there. They caught the guy. They were professional. They were stern with him. I mean, nobody was hurt, and they recovered everything. And I did find out another car he'd broken into, but I have all their change. So anyway, thank you for the wonderful police department and the wonderful city government we have. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, anybody else uh, like to give public comments tonight? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close public comments. Um, so the next up, uh, the next item up on the agenda is uh, the adoption of the consent agenda. So let me take a moment to uh, call out all of the items that we placed on the consent agenda at the work session last Thursday. Uh, and then if there are any objections, we'll hear those, and if there are none, we will uh, adopt the consent agenda. So the first item is culvert replacements, industrial park roads prior to paving. Uh, second item is professional services agreement for gold dust splash pad. Third item is the work order with Brennan, Brennan Jones to evaluate the sewer system along Anderson Road and the Cleghorn lift station. Number four, pipe material for industrial park culvert replacements. Number five, work order with Brennan Jones for Nally Road sewer review. Number six, professional services with Falcon Design Consultants for oversight of construction projects. Number seven, Gratic Communications video stream. Number eight, bid award for construction of Highway 78 water main extension. Number nine, bid award for the construction of Edge Road water main extension. Number 10, Price quotation on further engineering study of Pumpkintown Road speed limit reduction. Number 11, the purchase of one John Deere Gator Model TS. And number 12, Pine Mountain Gold Museum crossing arms. Are there any objections to those items? There are none. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Move to adopt the agenda. Second. I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda and a second. You got that? All in favor, raise your hand. It's unanimous. Okay, so we have adopted the consent agenda. We had uh, three other items, and we'll try to move through those very quickly because we, we just really had a minor change to the cover sheets for those. We'll get to them in a minute. Uh, next item up is B, governing body, the approval of the May 26, 2020 meeting minutes. Uh, council, you've reviewed those minutes. Uh, do I? Hear an amendment or a motion? I, uh, I have detected an error in the minutes, so I would ask that we table that to the next meeting so we can correct those minutes. All right, I have a motion to table those minutes to the next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to table the, the uh, meeting minutes of May 26, 2020 to the next uh, meeting. All in favor? That is also unanimous. Okay, we will now move on to C, Economic Development. Wesley, are you here? Please come forward. And the first item will be the professional services for architectural design and documentation. Go ahead. And you can do a brief overview. We've already been through this through the work session, and we'll see if council is ready to move forward. Uh, what, what we have here is a proposal to engage you architectural design come. services. Yeah, Excuse me. You Sorry about that. I did that last time too um, for several different projects that we're working on have been in the pipeline out at Pine Mountain Gold Museum for some time and uh, we're at the point now where we're ready to actually begin to the rubber meets the road in terms of design so we can actually begin to accomplish these tasks so we need to have approval for the design services in order for us to move forward with these designs, I'll be able to bid out these projects, and then we can look forward to actually resolving some of these issues in the, in the very near future. Okay, that, that seems like a sufficient review. The, the more detailed uh, information is available on the website. Council, do you have a, a motion? Uh, I'll so, make a motion that the city execute it. Ms. Shirley has made a motion that uh, we move that the city execute the attached proposal for prof professional architecture and design services for Pine Mountain Gold Museum projects not to exceed $30,225. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Discussion. Would, yes, ma'am. Go. Yeah, just wanted to mention this very briefly, and I mentioned it at the work session, but I think it's important. 
um, with some of the cool things that we want to do over there, some some citizens might say, well, why do we have the money to do what doesn't look like the needs necessarily? And it's really important to understand that that is the Douglas County side of the city, that there is Douglas County SPLOS money that has to be used according to what was approved ahead of time. And that's why those finances are available to do some of these things that, frankly, otherwise might have taken years. But that money is designated for certain things like parks, recreation, that sort of thing. And I just thought that, expl that explanation was important because people might say, how can we do that when we can't have a tractor that we said no to and some other things like that. That's all. Any other discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, Wesley, let's go to item number two, web design and services. Uh, to sum up, our website is basically under the umbrella of the city website, and because we have a unique operation, we sell a lot of tickets, we make a lot of reservations, we need something that is a little more robust and can be trans, can speak back and forth with the ticketing software systems and our register, et cetera. We need to bring our website into the 21st century so that we can continue to generate revenue, but also it's, it's visitor services, really. We want people to not be frustrated trying to get out there to see us or spend money with us or make a reservation or what have you. Okay. Uh, council, does anyone have a motion? Yeah. Make a read motion. The motion. We move the city execute the attached proposal for professional services from Line Biscuit Creative for web design and services. Web design for Pine Mountain Gold Museum not to exceed $5,500. All right, second. I have a motion. I have a second. Ms. Marchman. Yeah, all in favor? Ms. Ms. McPherson, would you like to make a comment on that, a discussion? No, I think we're good. All right, Thank it's you. unanimous. All right, let's move on to the third item, Wesley, Clover POS system. Is this dovetails with what we're trying to do with the website we have an older style push button register that is belongs in the museum not behind the <laughs> register uh, behind the counter rather and simply we can't provide the necessary reports uh, information we can't collect a lot of data that could be useful in marketing or offering different things because it's it's kind of a dumb machine, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, in addition to it being, you know, bringing us into the 21st century, there's going to be an immediate cost savings with this, uh, and that's part of the package that was uploaded to you guys earlier. It, there's a there will be an immediate effect, not uh, a major burden to the city in terms of making this change. This system will also dovetail neatly if other departments begin to upgrade into similar software, we should be able to become more of a network instead of machines that don't talk to each other. All right, thank you, Wesley. Uh, council, does anyone have a motion? I have a motion that we move that the city execute the attached proposal for the Clover system hardware, software, and professional services as provided by Omega BCS for Pine Mountain Gold Museum not to exceed $3,025. Okay. okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you. So, and and let I don't me... know about trivia, but I would love to have your help with the pollinator garden at Pine Mountain Gold Museum. <laughs> She had mentioned that to me actually separately and I offered to let her do my gardens at my house, but she didn't feel like that was civic duty, but I offered. Let me just, uh, in case it seemed at all uh, blasé with Councilwoman McPherson's comments about the Douglas County Sploss, the reason these three items got uh, put off until tonight was so that we could update the cover sheet to reflect that, that the money being spent on all three of these items comes from the Douglas County Sploss, so I don't mean to be blase about it. I just know that it's already on the cover sheet, and sometimes I take that for granted. So, uh, just that is a, that that that's a significant piece of information for the public to know. Okay, thank you, Wesley. The next item up is going to be human resources, Miss Rooks. Change in payroll provider. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as we discussed on Thursday, I'm proposing a change to our payroll, applicant tracking, performance management, learning management and payroll provider. 
currently we have two different providers for all of those things. We have NeoGov for our learning management and performance management. And then we have um, Thread for applicant tracking, payroll, and HR information systems, as well as benefits administration. We are proposing to change to uh, Paycom for a cost of $57,000. I have provided you with um, copies of the evaluations, how they look in the system, um, also with the course catalog for the learning management system. Um, like I said, as we discussed, this is a totally integrated system. Each section of this system talks to the other one, where the systems we have right now do not. This will allow us to do clocking in from your phone, doing performance evaluations from you. You can do anything in the system from the, their mobile app. So it's going to be much more effective for our employees. It's going to be easier. Um, right now, Thread requires probably 10 minutes to log in if you've forgotten your password. So, um, and this is just one or two clicks. Um, let's see. So we are, we are asking the council to approve changing from the two providers we have to one. Okay, and you did present this item uh, in, in some detail Thursday at the work session. Um, and I do think that going forward, we're going to want an integrated system. So I think that this is probably exactly what we, we want to do. But um, I'm not sure. We only got that information late today, and we had been right. looking for it since last Thursday. That doesn't mean we won't move forward with it. But I, I just want to note that maybe some of the council hasn't even been able to see it. With that, let me open this up for some discussion, and then we will we'll see where we're at. My concern is kind of the same one I had Thursday, and so I'll probably ask Tom if he's looked at some of this because now the first I've seen of this is now. Correct. And, and I hate to say it, but even with help. I have actually expanded that when I copied it, so it was even smaller than that previously. That's bad. <laughs> there is some of it that's ineligible, but I couldn't have read it anyway. Um, I saw some emails come in. I don't know, maybe an hour ago. I didn't get a chance to look at them. But I, I understand you said it's much easier to use. Um, it all works together. I like that. I like anything that saves money that still does the job that we need. Um, Mayor, you already expressed we don't want to pay the startup fee, so let's find something we're going to stick with so we don't keep paying startup fees in the right. beginning. Tom, um, your professional opinion on the personal evaluation part. I was not part of the review panel that did this. I think this was Stephanie, Sarah, and Shannon. Shannon. So those three are the ones that did the selection. Uh, any that other was council the part. Yeah, members have any other questions? Yeah. I, I, I think during the work session we talked about we were going to save $1,400, but in, that's – the savings after implementation are almost seven thousand dollars a year. Correct. So, I, you know, the benefit for the system is, is is a lot more than what we discussed in the work session. The benefits to the system, yes, they are. Let me ask you a question. Did you? So, sort of where we're at is that I think we all are going to agree that going to a an integrated system is going to be the right answer. I think a question that we might have, and we had hope that the city manager had been more involved but a question we might have is did you look at other providers was there uh, other options considered there were okay one of them was paylocity one was neogov and the other one was thread um, so we had three different providers thread is one we're using now we looked at neogov's total system um, they wanted over $70,000 mm -hmm. for their entire system. Would it also be a fully integrated system? It would be, yes. Okay, all right, go ahead. Very cumbersome. NeoGov is just difficult to navigate. Um, Paylocity of NeoGov, Thread, and there was one more. I don't know if it's in this backup. Okay, right. but you, an you answered my question, and 
we uh, we did have some discuss discussion about that on Wednesday as well. Um, I don't know that we could learn anything else by putting this off, uh, and I think we're headed in this direction anyway, so I don't have any reason. Council, does anybody have a, uh, a motion? Mayor, can yes, I sir. ask? Yes, um, sir. I was actually looking back at the work session agenda and the work session items, and uh, the there, we have now have a, in the, <clears throat> in our system here, we have a actual agreement and that was not included in the work session item. So uh, this is, would Wait be the minute. first time. Are you, Stephanie, uh, did you all add an item to the, to the uh, packet that was not there Thursday? Is it that should the, have been uh, there Thursday. That's the third attachment, pay, pay. No, Shannon sent it to you to add. So you're saying that it was added originally? there so you don't recall seeing it councilman no, and I don't recall time. seeing that I that being the case what well, how urgent is it that you get this um, to get the discounts that we have negotiated it is imperative that we do it the, at this soon. meeting or can we do it this meeting would be we'd have to they'd have to reprice everything for the I don't recall meeting. seeing the agreement yes ma'am when did you attach that? Okay, then uh, the items cannot be added Thursday. onto the packet if we're not notified that they're there. We have no way to, to review them. I don't see, unless someone wants to try to move forward with this tonight, I think you need to table it till the next meeting. Let me, let me, in, in Elisa's defense, I know, <laughs> I know you did send us some emails of things that were going to be added. Is this one of them? Because, yeah, I take in so much information sometimes I can't either. I'm like numerous emails and I, so I can't state exactly when I saw it. Um, okay. Any other discussion? Is there a motion? Make a motion we table until the. Uh, August meeting. Okay, I have a motion to table this item to the August uh, council meeting. Do I have a second? I have a second. I have and a motion and a second. Discussion. And I, I would say the, the next council meeting because we might end up with a call meeting in between. So. Sure, yeah, we may. There's a chance. Okay, point. do you, you have um, some discussion? So if it all gets repriced, could this all change what we're paying for something we really expect to approve? That's, that's my concern. I want us to look at everything. I had a little concern about the evaluations because we've always looked at that a little more, but I'm willing to defer to uh, the city manager on that. But I like the fact that y'all used a team. You had three different people working on it. I, I still kind of like the city manager that we hired looking at it. You know what I mean? Because it's really important. This is going to be, we've talked about how important evaluation, proper evaluation system is for us. Um, I am concerned about the tabling if it's going to get all repriced and that could be, you know, a detriment to us, but I won't stop it if you feel strong enough. Uh, hang on just a second, man. I didn't hear you say that it's going to be repriced. You said that it would be ideal if we did it tonight. It will be repriced. It, okay. it will be repriced. For sure. Yes. It may be the same price, but they're going to have to go through all their approvals again it took them over a week to get this last approval I, council i i will defer to whatever you do but i'm going to suggest that if we don't have the agreement in the packet we cannot fully make a decision on this so let me call this vote and if it fails did, we'll look at the, another one did the city attorney look at the uh, yeah that was I my have question. forwarded it to the city attorney i have not heard anything t from him yeah that's that was my concern too it, did legal review this so well he okay all right mr montan hey. did you have any other comments uh no i mean that was it i mean i that was my primary concern did legal review this i mean personally looking at it it's got a, a choice of venue clause that we have to bring any lawsuit in the state of oklahoma so i don't know if that's negotiable or not but it's not something Avery, that I have would. you reviewed this I have not. okay well that's concerning in and of itself so, in defense um, of the attorneys. 
We have usually, one that's ill. Thank you for being here. Usually what in. David does and what we do on these agreements is we mark through the other state and put Georgia in there. And we but notify the vendor. We notify the vendor because we can't do we can't abide by any laws in another state. It's a Georgia law. Okay. So, Tom, do you have any comments? Do you have anything to add? Okay. All right, so I have a motion to table and a second. All in favor? It's unanimous. We will table it to the to the next meeting in August. Stephanie, would you send the agreement to Avery? Pardon? It's in the packet. Avery has the packet. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I, I thought we would close that out tonight, but when an item, when a significant piece of it gets added to the packet and we have no idea it's there, it's hard to move forward. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is E Finance, Miss Sarah Andrews. May 2020 financial update. Welcome back. Thank you. Good evening. All right, this is our May 2020 update, the mayor said. I uh, just want to point out, I handed y'all the audit reports for 2019. So that's through September 30th of 2019. Uh, the auditor will be here at the next meeting to go over that. But if you want to look at that beforehand, and I believe we have our finance committee meeting July 29th, so we can talk about it then as well. All right. First up is our cash slide. This shows our cash balances at this date and point, which is May 31st of last year and May 31st of this year. Our, that first line is our total cash in CD has grown from 14.7 million to 18.6 million. Uh, the next three lines, the general fund, the water sewer fund, and the sanitation fund, they are part of our pooled cash operating bank account, but the system tracks which fund they belong to. You can see the general fund has grown to 7.4 million. Water sewer fund has grown as well. And sanitation <coughs> fund is no longer in the negative. It is $12,000 positive. Uh, those last three items are our SPLOST accounts. You can see those have grown as we have been collecting SPLOST money and haven't been spending it as much as we were last year. The next item is our building permits. This this one, I'm just showing you the residential growth. These are new construction permits for houses in Villarica. At, through the fiscal year, May of 2019, we had taken 160 permits. And through May of 2020, we have taken um, 178. And you can see the water and sewer taps are keeping in line with that. The next slide shows our water and sewer net income statement. Again, this is year to date through May 2019 and year to date through May 2020. The revenue shows after three rate increases, that miscellaneous revenue line item includes tap fees. So as we have brought in those uh, building permits, they're also paying for water and sewer tap fees. So you can see how that's um, keeping up as well. Um, one of the big things we've been working on in the last three years with our budgets is getting ready for the debt payment increase. You can see that down there where the yellow box points out the debt payment increase. We did take on a significant increase this year, but we were ready for it. Um, and then you can see how much the net income has grown from last year to this year. We're at one point, almost $1.4 million so far this fiscal year. Next is the sanitation fund. Again, on that cash slide, you saw that at this point last year we had negative cash. This year we have positive cash. And you can see last year we only had a net income of $6,000, where this year we're at $60,000. So. Um, we have finally made that fund to be self-sufficient. All right, so about lost and splossed. So this is our sales tax and our special uh, local option sales tax. This is a comparison month to month. So this isn't year to date comparisons. This is March of 2019 compared to March of 2020 for both counties. In March, Carroll was down 4%, Douglas was down 10 compared to the prior <laughs> March. April, Carroll was down seven, Douglas was down 12%, but in May, both months, or both counties saw um, improvement over even the last year. So uh, year to date, Carroll County is looking like we'll probably hit our budget. Um, Douglas is slightly under budget overall, but um, if we have some more good months, we may see that hit budget. 
Next is our self-funded insurance. So the first year, first 12 to 15 months, uh, we had savings of over $700,000 and we've remained pretty flat um, since then. But this fiscal year, we're starting to see some more savings. Uh, just want to remind y'all that we only fund 90% of what we actually, um, what our maximum liability could be. So um, we're, we are having savings below even that. And, um, and that is with, um, you know, we changed the co-pays for the employees so that the employees actually have a richer benefit plan now. Um, so with that, you can see now that the savings have grown to 840000 since we've been on this self-funded plan. And moving on. So since I handed out the audit, I wanted to update y'all on our fund balance. The fund balance doesn't change every month. It's really just kind of as the audit is completed, we can see where we stand. So fund balance is basically your, um, this is the unrestricted portion of our fund balance. So that is the, basically, the net income that has built up over the years. Uh, leaves us with um, kind of our, our saving, um, savings. It's, our, I think our policy states that we want to have 25%. So that's 25% of your expenses you want available in your fund balance, in case of an emergency, or if you have big capital projects that you want to invest in. Um, however, we'd like to be closer to the 40%. Um, anyway, with this, I wanted to point out, because this was a big deal, um, in 2017, we had $5 million. Now, in 2018, we asked the council to switch to a different fiscal year end. We had a December 31 year end, but because of the way our revenue comes in with property taxes and things, we asked council to change it to an October to September fiscal year, knowing we would take a big hit in our fund balance, which we did. Uh, you can see in 2018, which was our nine month fiscal year, we dropped down to 3.6 million. However, with 2019 being our first year on that new fiscal year, uh, we, are, we have caught back up to the $5 million, 5.1 in fact. Uh, for water and sewer, we didn't take a hit for the short year like we did in general fund, but I just wanted to point out because it's very significant and it's thank thanks to the mayor and the council for y'all making the hard decision to do rate increases over the years. Um, in 2014, we had a $1.1 million fund balance. So that wasn't even 25%. Uh, and I believe the cash was negative at that point. So we had a negative cash, our fund balance was really low, but in five years, we've grown it back to $5 million, or grown it to $5 million. I don't think it's ever been there. So thank you, Council, for all your hard decisions with that. And then this is just a picture of the fund balance for our major funds. So this is the general fund. So this is where our taxes and things are. Um, you can see how it ha has kind of decreased over the years um, with taking that big hit in 2018. Again, that was the, the fiscal year change. But in 2019, we made that back up. So. Uh, water and sewer, like I pointed out, we have grown significantly. Um, um, like I said, council has made the hard decisions to raise rates, but has put us uh, where we are now, which is $5 million in our fund balance. That prepares us for emergencies, prepares us for the debt payments, but it also allows us to pay for capital improvements that we significantly need. And lastly, I know it looks like a cool slide where I flipped the graph upside down. No, that's because it was negative. Um, this is a sanitation fund. Unfortunately, it has been negative for many years. 2019, it's a negative $9,000, but after a positive income year this year, we will actually have a positive fund balance at the end of this year. So kudos to the council and the mayor. Thank you all very much. Any questions for me? All right, thank you. Um, let me just ask a question about the audit. Will yes. we have a presentation uh, from the auditors at the next council meeting? Okay. Yes. All right, good. Council, do you have any questions for Ms. Sarah? Okay. All right. I guess they have absorbed it and asked their questions outside of this meeting. Thank you, Thank you. Ms. Sarah. Okay. Next item up on the agenda is going to be Chris Montesinos, F1, Billerica Zoning Ordinance and Official Zoning Map. Tonight we will have a presentation by Chris and then we will move to a public hearing. Come on, Chris. Good Let's just go mayor. ahead and wait on that train. Okay. Just for a moment. Right. 
go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, in this uh, section of the presentation, I just want to give you an update on where we are with, with respect to the uh, adoption process. Uh, of course, we've been through the ordinance process, and then we've gone on to the application of zoning onto specific parcels. And uh, with that comes uh, uh, the objections to the changes of zoning. Um, I've given you a handout here, and I've got some extra copies that I'm going to leave on the table out front for anyone who is interested. It's kind of using an outline of uh, how many parcels we're dealing with with respect to initiating modifications to the zoning or the application of new zoning districts to existing properties. Uh, from that, we identify uh, the number of properties that are being substantively affected, meaning they're going from a commercial to a residential or a industrial to residential or something along those lines. We, we flag those. Those we've uh, identified, we sent them letters of intent to rezone. Those were sent certified. Uh, we've accounted for 100% of those in return. Uh, we received 27 objections, and that's not 27 individuals, but that's for 27 properties uh, out of 6,684. So that's a very small margin. Um, of those 27, um, we were able to address 11 properties through the administrative uh, modification process. That was presented at the last uh, council work session. Um, and then we had two of those objections that were withdrawn. So what we're at now is we have 10 properties, which uh, I believe is uh, represented by seven property owners that are moving forward. Once the uh, zoning ordinance and the zoning map are adopted, those will move forward to the planning commission for their actual appeal process and then to the city council for a final decision. So just wanted to walk you through where we are in this stage of the process and uh, I'm here to answer any additional questions you may have. Okay, and most of that you you did present uh, Thursday, and you also have a pretty detailed uh, handout that you've given to us. So I didn't recall Thursday you saying that two of the those appeals had been withdrawn. Okay, Sorry. and now there are seven property owners uh, who have. Let me try to get this clear in my head. Okay, all right. Now I recall what we were doing here. All right, council, does anybody have any questions for Chris? Okay, we've talked about this for a long time. We've had a lot of information coming in on a regular basis that we probably review outside of these uh, meetings. So I know that most council members have met with Chris individually. I know I've had a number of meetings with him, so. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that we're sort of at a place where we don't have a lot of questions right now. So, uh, Avery, with that, we want to move to the uh, public hearing. Um, do we just open up the floor for that for anyone right now? Yes, you go. Uh, speaking to you. You can take comments uh, from people that are uh, opposed to the... Uh, uh, or in favor of the uh, changes. Okay. All right. So as I stated earlier tonight, we will not vote on adopting this tonight, but we, we did advertise for a public hearing. So with that, we are going to hold the public hearing, and I'm going to ask if anyone who would like to speak in favor or against this uh, zoning uh, come forward now. You may come to the podium here and remove your mask and speak. Thank you, Chris. Call you back up in a moment. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Mayor, Council, my name's Robert Walker. I'm an attorney at Jenkins, Bowen, and Walker in Cartersville, Georgia. Um, I am here on behalf of my clients, um, Morgan Satterfield Investments and Cooey and Morgan Investments, um, who own. Uh, four separate tracts of property um, that are the southernmost tracks in the city of Villarica on Highway 61. 
So um, these are the southernmost tracks on Highway 61 um, in Villarica, and there are two on, on, one, on the east side of 61 and two on the west side. Would you, would you clarify for me which property, who is the owner? Uh, Cooey and Morgan Investments and Morgan Satterfield Investments um, are the two property owners. Give me just a moment. Chris, will you tell me which of these uh, parcels we're talking about? Because I don't see those names. Uh, yes, sir. That'd be Morris Shackleford. Is that what it is? I do see Morris Shackleford. Okay. All right. We just don't have it down that way, sir. I want to know which one you were talking about. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, Your Honor, we, we represent these folks. They had this property, and, and Joel Morris is here as well, and he is the broker and listing agent for, for my clients and will be able to answer any property-specific questions that may exist. Um, but uh, they bought this property and owned this property, had the property rezoned by the city back um, before the recession in 2008. The property was rezoned... Um, uh, commercial um, and the uh, and now the property is being proposed to be rezoned to, to an agricultural use and uh, that's uh, precisely what we uh, have an issue with uh, we're not asking necessarily that uh, we're not challenging the entire enactment of the zoning ordinance but only as it's you know applied to our clients property um, we would ask that you know a condition be made to any any uh, passage that would uh, result in no change in the zoning being made to, to our clients. They've expended a substantial amount of money in reliance on the approval that the city gave, uh, the rezoning that the city gave prior to 2008. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars has been spent on that property. It has underground utilities. Um, it's been, there's been paving done. There's sewer. There's uh, a lift station that's been put in place um, for sewer. Um, and so it would cause a substantial detriment to our clients uh, if this property were, were changed to an agricultural zoning use. Our clients also have, and I'm, there are a couple of things that I would like to, to put into the record of the property, uh, or put into the record here. One is a letter that was sent by our, of, by our office to uh, Mr. Montesinos on February 21st of 2020. Um, and uh, we have a copy of that, that I'd like to put in as part of the record. There's also a letter that was sent on June 10th of 2020 uh, to Mr. Montesinos as well. Um, both of those raise uh, our objections, both constitutional and otherwise, um, to this uh, proposed rezoning. And so uh, we'd like to include those. I also have a copy of two uh, contracts for the sale of the property that we would like to consider as what we would like to put into the record as well. Mr. Morris can talk more about those. They are redacted for the purchase price uh, that has been redacted out of them, but they are purchase and sell agreements that my client currently has on these two properties um, that uh, they are going to be bought at a, at a, um, at a substantial price based on the uh, current zoning that is in effect. We believe that if this property is rezoned um, pursuant to the language in the contract, that the purchaser has the right um, to declare the purchase and, and uh, option null and void, and uh, that, that those contracts will be lost at a substantial uh, detriment to our client, millions of dollars. Um, we've also, as part of those earlier letters that were submitted, we submitted a a statement from a certified real estate appraiser that said that should this property re be rezoned in the manner that's been proposed, that the value would be uh, reduced from uh, over $100,000 per acre to, uh, less, to less than $5,000 per acre. Um, and so again, we believe that it would be a substantial detriment. We believe our client has vested rights um, to use the property pursuant to the zoning that was granted by the by the council previously and uh, they have suspended substantial amounts of money as mentioned earlier uh, in reliance on that um, we would also like to point out that what we're asking for is really not for the 
for the, for the council to give our clients anything. It's, it's, it's rather for them not to take away what has previously been given. And so, um, again, uh, the other thing that I would like to point out is that as we read the ordinance, and, and I also have a copy of this as well, the, uh, uh, the future land use map, as we read the proposed rezoning, we believe that it is inconsistent with the future land use map that the city has. And so these properties are shown on the future land use map. Um, Sir, can you get a little close to the... Yeah, these properties are shown on the future land use map to be um, the west, on the western side of 61 is shown to be industrial on the future land use map. And on the eastern side of 61 is shown to be suburban village. Um, we believe the, the mixed use commercial development that our clients are, going, are proposing to do on this property is consistent with that suburban village um, character and uh, is actually less intensive than the industrial use that's shown on the future land use map. And so um, rezoning the property to ag we believe would be inconsistent again not, not just with our vested rights and, and the uh, uh, state and federal constitutions um, but also the, the city's own future land use map. Um, so we, we would ask again these two properties be exempted from this and I would point out that we acknowledge that whatever our clients propose to do on that property will be submitted to the city um, through site plans and the city will have an opportunity to review that and make sure that it is consistent with the current existing ordinances of, uh, of the city. And in fact, Mr. Morris tells me that we, uh, the clients are close, we're waiting on engineers to finish those site plans up and we expect to have them within the next couple of weeks. And uh, at that point, they would be submitted to the city and again, the city would have an opportunity to make sure that uh, the property is consistent with all the, the now you know, existing ordinances that are in place. Okay, well I appreciate that. Uh, so let me just clarify a couple of things. This property was rezoned in 2008. Uh, and this uh, is 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. And these vested rights, this contract that you have is dated when? This contract is dated um, I will tell you exactly. It is dated March of 2020. Okay, Council, do you have any questions for this gentleman? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Young. When uh, when this goes to planning and zoning, I would like to make sure that we submit to planning and zoning all of these infrastructure improvements so they know the extent of what you're claiming so that they, they make a, a fair judgment. Okay. And, and again, Mr. Morris can talk to you perhaps in a little more detail about what those uh, improvements are. Okay. Um, and he may, may be able to answer any specific questions that you or any, any members all may right. have. Mr. Montahan. Uh, yeah, I just have a question about the <clears throat> alleged improvements at the property. Uh, considering the sewer, the lift station, underground utilities, and so forth. Um, but at the same time, you have also stated that you'll be going back through plan review. So were those improvements done under a, a previous land disturbance application, or why were those improvements done prior to going to civil plan review now? Yes, it's my understanding that they were done previously, um, that the property... There was a planned development on the property that did not go forward because of the recession. And so um, those were, were previously done in connection with that. Um, this is a new site plan, um, but would, would obviously use and, and, and uh, make, make use of, of the pre-existing improvements that are out there on the property now. And did the previous, previously approved land disturbance permit or application expire or why not just continue under the existing one? Well, that, that's, a, that's a, it's a good question. Uh, we may have the ability to do that. We believe we do have vested rights and we have the ability to proceed under those rights regardless of, quite frankly, of what the, the city were to do here. Um, but again, we are trying and our concern is that if this matter, I, I realize the matter is not going to be voted on today. 
But our concern is that under the current state of Georgia law, that if and when this were voted on, if it were uh, uh, rezoned pursuant to this, this ordinance and uh, the rezoning map was adopted making those changes that um, we would potentially have to file a suit um, against the city to protect our clients rights to challenge that decision. I know there's been mention of some administrative process of appeal that may be able to take place, um, but this is a uh, questionable, this falls within a gray area of whether or not this is a legislative or quasi-judicial type decision that would require a challenge or, or else you'd lose that right. And that's quite frankly the last thing on, on the planet that we want to do is have to file a lawsuit. Um, but there is uh, quite frankly millions of dollars on the line and, and uh, we, will, we will have to protect our clients' rights and they'll, they'll proceed in the, in the fashion that they deem uh, appropriate. But uh, we're just asking that these properties, we think these properties are unique by virtue of, of the improvements that have been made and, and the information that we've submitted. And so we would ask that these properties simply be, be omitted from this um, ordinance if and when it is voted on. Um, and allowed to proceed under the, the current zone, uh, All right. zoning. Sir, hang on a second. You, you talk pretty low anyway, and you're not really at the okay. microphone, and this train is going to drown you out. Give it just a moment. All right. That's probably an Amtrak. It moved kind of quick. Let me, <laughs> let me just say a couple things. Council, does anybody have any, any additional questions for the applicant, for the applicant's representative? Okay. So, Chris, would you come up? Thank you, yes, sir. Thank I, I may not have a question for you. I just want to ask a couple of questions to uh, Chris. And who may I give these documents? Yes, sir. I was going to ask you anything that you wanted to submit for the record. Please hand it to the to the clerk. Okay. Chris, under the current uh, zoning, uh, not the proposed zoning, uh, from the time that a zoning is granted, uh, what period of time is that initially granted for? Uh, for one year. For one year. So this was granted in 2008. Correct. And our zoning, my understanding is, and I'm, I'm used to David being here, so I'm gonna try to lean on you. But if you're not comfortable, just say, hey, we'll, sure. you know, uh, we'll we'll wait for a legal opinion, or we'll poke at Avery and see if he can do it. But the way it's currently written, uh, it is such that the council may uh, revert that zoning after one year. Correct. correct. If yes. we haven't met certain. So it, I would think any time after 12 years, uh, we probably would be on uh, pretty safe ground there. Correct. Okay. All right. Avery, is that, have you reviewed our zoning ordinance? Not for that particular purpose, no. Okay. But, uh, Very good. I believe That's in fine. my conversations with David, that is correct. I only bring that up because you have been involved in an administrative review process, and I would assume that the claims that uh, were made tonight would have been considered as part of that administrative review. Correct. And I guess that LDP would have expired after a year. Is that my, is that correct? All right, thank you, Bobby. Okay, are there anyone else here who would like to speak for or against this rezoning map? Yes, sir, Joel. Please state your name and address Joel for the Morris, uh, Joel Morris, I live on Flat Rock Road here in Villarreca. Um, like Mr. Walker said, I'm the broker for the property in question that we're talking about um just just to add to your comment i, I understand about the the um the one year expiration of the zoning i will ask this if if that were the case and that zoning was going to be brought back to ag at that point the the people that that bought the property have been paying taxes on it as a commercial piece of property um so to just say well it, it reverted back to ag anyway i think that would not be correct um, I'd also like to ask Mr. Montesinos um, the fact that uh, he said there were 6,000 properties. Yes, up. sir. Uh, the total is in, in the city of Villarica is 6,684. And that, that would be all commercial properties that are going to be No, sir. That's all ag. parcels in the entire city. I'm sorry. I'm answering for you. Is that correct, Chris? <clears throat> That's all parcels in the city of Villarica. So I would, I would ask what the total of just commercial properties that are changing zoning versus you know, obviously the, the ordinance is going to affect every property in the city limits. It's not going to rezone every commercial property in the city limits. So I, I think that's where our, uh, our argument is going to kind of end up there. So. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, do, does anyone have any questions for, um, Joel? 
Okay, Chris, would you come back up? Okay. One second. So, I was also going to say the improvements that have been made to the property are significant. Um, Mr. Barber and I have had a meeting about it. Um, some of this will actually help you guys out with some of your infrastructure work. I know there's some problems with some sewer capabilities or capacity on that side of I-20. Um, we feel like this could possibly help out with that. Um, the, the lift station was put in there with the plan. There definitely is a bore under the highway. Um, so it is a very unique piece of property in the fact that it has been highly developed. Uh, you, you can't dispute that. You can go by and, and, and ride by and see that. I mean, there's curb gutter, there's paved, a paved street, there's underground. Just for reference, this is the property, well, at least one side of the 61 <clears throat> is where they hold the rodeo. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. That's right. And there is a road that went back there because That's right. at one time they were going to finish the subdivision. There's detention ponds, there's underground utilities, street lights, um, and the, the proposed development is definitely going to be something I think the city is going to like to see. It's, it's a mixed-use style development. It does have a co commercial component to it that will definitely affect the contract. And that's what the contract reflects, or right. th that's what you know to that, be well, that's the what intent the, of this that, that is what the uh, site plan that we're trying to get put together currently is going to reflect. Well, one thing we know for sure is we're not going to vote on this tonight. So right. if the attorney is correct and you have a site plan ready within the next three weeks or something along those lines, That'll be something I'm sure that uh, Chris will, will be able to take a look at and Tom uh, for an administrative review. But um, <coughs> at this time, I mean, we can only go by what, uh, what's been recommended to us. So we'll continue on that path. Does anybody have any questions for Joel? All right. Thank you, Joel. All right. Anybody else like to speak for or against uh, this zoning map tonight? Okay. Seeing no one else, uh, I will close the public hearing portion. And this will revert back to staff. Does anyone, uh, any council members have any questions for staff? Any member of staff? We also have our city engineer uh, in the room and the city manager. Council members? Okay. I, I, I was a little curious on this property he was talking about. It's going to revert back to agricultural. Are they going to reapply for a zoning change on it? Is that what, what was intended? Well, let me, just for a point of clarity, uh, let you understand why it is that this did not uh, pass the administrative uh, adjustment portion and went to the recommendation to go to Planning Commission. Um, the comprehensive plan identifies, as this gentleman has pointed out, that, half, that the eastern side of the, of the two properties is zoned suburban uh, village. Uh, general commercial is not a recommended zoning district for suburban village. The equivalent of the new zoning is C2, which would also not be consistent with the comprehensive plan. As they also mentioned, the properties on the western side are, <coughs> are indicated as industrial properties in the comp plan. And again, GC or C2 are not recommended zoning districts for those. That said, that was one of the criteria that we passed it on as a threshold. Number two, the contracts that they were talking about were never included in the original appeal. And when it was brought to my attention that there was contracts out there, I asked the attorney over two weeks ago if they would email those to me. I had someone actually call me the other day to say, hey, these are under contract. And I said, great, give me the contracts. We can include them in the packets. Uh, so that wasn't done. Uh, the references to the infrastructure with the lift stations that are actually incomplete um, and the other investments to the property, which were actually done under the previous LDP by the prior owner, was not done by the, this current applicant. So I'm not discounting all those things, but those are just considerations which made it where I was not comfortable making a recommendation to this body or to the Planning Commission that this should be prescribed ahead of time. It needs to go through the process, through due process. We are uh, meeting every obligation under the current Unified Development Code as far as zoning, the authority of zoning powers, the abandonment of development with respect to the lack of follow through on permits and the rights that the city council has to review and change or revert the zoning 
as well, looking at the bigger picture, this is a citywide zoning effort. This isn't just these five properties. There are currently in the appeal process uh, three other appealers who are going from general commercial to another zoning district. So this is not particular to their situation. This was just that they did not meet those basic thresholds that gave me the ability to recommend to this body that we make a change in, a, in advance of the adoption. So this then is going to the planning commission upon adoption and they will have the due process and the right and the ability to express what they've tried to articulate tonight in advance of that process. But that is how the process is uh, currently laid out. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is the administrative review process closed? No, okay. it's not closed until the um, Adoption? ordinance is adopted. Okay, Correct. so they could still continue to submit now that they have whatever they have at this point. I heard the contract and some other Yes. You could I, still review some of that at this point? That's correct. Okay. Um, that's, but that still doesn't change the fact that it's not consistent with the comprehensive plan. Not so suggesting therefore, that it will. I just want to know if they can continue through yeah. the administrative process. Yes, they can. Okay. And if it, if it still doesn't meet, then we will continue on with what we laid out. And I appreciate correct. that. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that, Danny. Anybody else have any? Yes, sir. Mop to hand. Uh, Chris, maybe this is a Chris and Bobby or Chris or Bobby question. How much of the infrastructure that's already been installed, I guess, do we know, do we have any indication on whether the infrastructure that's installed out there now is sufficient to meet current city code and would have to be redone anyway to, to be upgraded to current city code? Do we have any estimation to that whatsoever? Once the land disturbance permit was abandoned back in the day, um, we've had... Um, several environmental laws and rules changed since then. Um, once the project is, is picked back up to move forward, they'll have to meet all new regulations as they relate to that development. That's detention, water quality, channel protection, buffers, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. And considering it's been 12 years since our 10 years at least since the LTP, I presume. I have no records issued. where the, where where that infrastructure was ever inspected by city staff. Okay. And, so and of course, that, you know, it can be, all the sewers can be televised, cleaned, inspected that way. Um, we've got another residential development right now that's, that's in the process of cleaning up a bunch of stuff. Um, but yes, all the, new, all the new requirements as of today will have to be met. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, council, anybody else have any questions? Nope. Okay, since we have had the, the public hearing, uh, we have closed that and we have uh, completed uh, the discussion here, we are not going to be taking action on this tonight uh, anyway, so we will move on and I think that that's going to be the end of our night, except the star of the show, city manager has a city manager's report. It's always the highlight of the reviews I get. Go ahead. A sad commentary on the rest of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, if you have not been to Goldust Park recently, the playground equipment has been erected, mulch has uh, been placed, and last week, I think Wednesday, we installed some ridiculous amount of sod, maybe 26 pallets or something similar. We're hoping to have uh, the playground open next Monday so if you have not been out there to uh, take a look it's really attractive uh, we have tried to keep you abreast of the um, progress being made by pond who is the contractor doing the transportation study uh, as you can imagine the virus has sort of blown the public input part of their process to smithereens but we're trying to slowly get back into the, a position where we can have uh, public meetings and stakeholder meetings and satisfy that part of what they would normally do so we'll keep you abreast of those because I'd like for all of you to attend those uh, as they come up I'm being told by email from 
Georgia DOT that the Liberty Road Bridge was scheduled to be completed on time, which would be tomorrow. Tomorrow. So maybe Thursday we can cross the bridge again. We'll see. They've paid, they've paid both sides of it. Right. I saw that they had redone the approaches. My, my reading was that it will be open tomorrow. Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll let you say that it's going to be open tomorrow. Well, I've already <laughs> said it in the paper, so All right. may as well say it here. All right. Go ahead. Um, one, of, one of the bids that you approved tonight was for the replacement of all six of the stormwater culverts in our industrial park. If you, if you wondered how that got to the top of the list, we have had a, um, we're making an effort to implement a philosophy which says that people that resurface roads when there's work to be done underneath them, but don't do that work and resurface first are dumb. <laughs> and so, we we are proactively going to replace the old metal pipes that are under the road in the park in six different places with concrete pipe so that when Bobby's RFP comes back on the paving for this year, we'll be able to go in there and actually mill and top coat a significant part of the industrial park and then know that we've got, I don't know how many years out of this pipe, 50 years, 20 years, a lot of years. Anyway, it, we're just going to try not to be dumb. Um, that RFP for paving has been circulated and has a July 31 closing date, which means it won't be on the August agenda, but will be on the September agenda, I think, unless Bobby stands on his head or something. Because I think the agenda closing date's like the 30th or something similar. Uh, Janet and I have continued to meet with Andy Camp. If you can imagine the frustration that Pond has with doing stakeholder meetings you can imagine what doing economic developments like right now especially on the retail restaurant you know downtown shop kind of scale but what Andy and his folks are doing um, is is to try to take advantage of any virtual zoom based um, retail conference to get in front of developers and in front of site locators we, we've actually made a little progress with that. Um, so we'll keep you abreast if any of that becomes real, but we are still working on that. I think we've mentioned before that the Carroll County SPLOST will not um, go to referendum whenever it was originally scheduled, but is now next March. So hopefully that's a good thing. Um, staff has recently met with the guys from Ar Arbor Valley, who is the developer that will be building the apartments on Anderson Road. They are planning a groundbreaking right now of March of 20. I think that's pretty cool. That will be the first project in the TAD area. Wait, wait a minute. Miss March, March. March of 21. <laughs> Okay. I was. I knew it was 21. We have one person paying attention in the front. I knew Thank it was 21, you, so Ms. I was Martin. just letting it go. Mar I, I have March of 20 here on my notes, but yeah, March of 21. She said, haven't we passed that? <laughs> All right. Um, Janet and I have also met with representatives of T2 Solutions, who we've been talking to, to get our wrap our heads around what we could do to improve the parking situation downtown. The, the issue that we have is we have two really significant sources of employment downtown that are offices that gobble a whole lot of the prime parking space downtown in the, the two main blocks on the south side of, of the railroad. So we're looking at a system that would allow us to monitor the spaces with this approach. Um, you'd have a meter, an automated meter that about every 10 or 12 spaces, and you would, 
when you approach the meter, the the first hour is free, right? So there'd be no disruption to people that are, you know, just going in to eat lunch and that kind of thing. But you'd have to pay for time beyond that. It's based on your car tag. So there's no numbering of the spaces. You put your tag in, you pay for however long you want to be there. If it's just an hour, it doesn't cost you anything. But it keeps up with the tag so you can only use it once a day. So you only get the free hour once a day. And what we're trying to do is determine where we can move all the employees so that we have that two block area open. Now what I envision is gonna happen is if we do that on the two front blocks, we're gonna just create a problem in the back, right? Because if I'm an employee of those companies, if I can't park on 78, I'm gonna park them on uh, Wilson, right? So we gotta do it on Wilson too. Well, if we do that, then we're gonna push them east and they're gonna park in the public parking lot at the corner of Carroll and Wilson and they're gonna park in the front, right, where Edward Jones and Moral Norman and all that is. So we gotta put, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's sort of like, we gotta keep doing it till we get to an area, uh, you know, where we're comfortable with people parking, which for us would be here, right? 61 on this side of the railroad is where we would like to have people park. We may also have a problem at the drugstore, right? Because you got a pretty nice lot there beside Wicks Tavern, so we may have to do something down there too. But anyway, so we're chasing that down. It may not come to anything, but we're trying to figure it out because we're choking our restaurants, um, some of the downtown retail establishments, so we're working on that. We've had an employee luncheon since we met last. Um, it was moderately successful. I thought it was well attended, but the way we did the food was still a struggle. Um, just delivering enough meals fast enough is, has been a challenge in those, and so we're still talking about how to do that better. Um, Bobby and I have met with Pond one time to look at sort of a draft of the transportation stuff. Um, I like some of it. I didn't like some of it. We told them what we didn't like. They went back. They're working on it. Several of us um, went on a tour. Uh, since we uh, met last, we went to Hateful to take a look at their downtown. They have adopted a brand. Uh, I don't know, Chris, uh, Chris is gone. I can't. I don't remember the name, but they basically have become like an art downtown. So they've just muraled every vertical space of their downtown. There are paintings everywhere on uh, the walls of buildings. So we got to see that, took a lot of photos, got some good ideas, got to meet with their staff. One of the things that they did that, if you've not been to Hateful, it, it has a, um, a downtown bisected by a railroad. They received a huge amount of money in a federal earmark, I guess um, two administrations ago, and they fenced their railroad from, if you know Hateful, Hateful runs basically from 70, in between 75 and 85, right? Below the split, right? So Central Avenue runs east and west, the railroad runs east and west, and they fenced their railroad from the Ford plant west to Metropolitan, which is their main drag going north and south, with a black wrought iron fence on both sides. It is so cool. I don't know how, how we would ever get that money, but that with silent crossings, I mean, it it was it was thought provoking. Did you take any pictures? Good. Yeah, it, it was thought provoking. Uh, I had never seen a. I don't think I've ever seen a downtown with a railroad that was fenced. If I have, I. I where's Janet? Have you ever seen one? I don't. Are they the one that in a picture had an approach to with a pedestrian crossing over it? I was trying mm -hmm. to remember because I get it. Yeah. Yeah, Chris took some Very pictures. austere. It's just a concrete stairway 
with a with a crossing and a concrete stairway. I mean, it's not attractive at all, but functional. All right, um, we didn't have a lot of public stuff going up. Um, concerts, you know, were gone, but we did have a leadership luncheon here. Zoom. Mike Dugan spoke. Uh, we've had a, a bunch of rallies since we met last time. Some of them you've attended. Um, we received our $10,000 safety grant from Garma recently. So if you're familiar with that, that's I think rolls around once a year, which is amazing since we've not been their best customer in the in recent memory. Um, we're still working with the guys on the water treatment plant, water, the raw water source. We're working on that still. You've approved a couple of water line extensions, which we appreciate. Uh, Edge Road, Pete, would that take us two years? So all that did, that engineering took two years, easement acquisition and all that. But that's a fire protection project, you remember? We're gonna get a big pipe on, on Edge Road. Um, it'll help. Mr. Carter waters yard, um, <laughs> and then Lake water. <laughs> and then the seven the seventy eight project right from Dairy Queen down to, to the old Rite Aid, which is family or dollar $70. something or whatever it is, going to put in an eight inch line on that north side. We're working with a guy who's that y'all approved who is helping us with easements. Um, it's exactly what we thought it was going to be like. But we're making progress, so we're actually getting easements from people. So we think we'll be, we'll have that ready when we um, when we get on the the contract side on the in installation ready. We hadn't talked about water first in a while. So another victim of the virus is the water first application. If we're awarded this designation, it saves us one percent on GFA loans, and considering that GFA loans are like you know, 1.9% to begin with, 1% is a lot. So that gets us, you know, almost free money. We're going to make that presentation next Tuesday. So we've rescheduled for March, and we're going to present to representatives of other cities that have water first designation and try to sell them on why we're wonderful and why they should give it to us. Um, Carroll County Schools has announced that they're going to open on Monday, April, uh, August the 10th. I understand that Douglas is doing the same. Yeah. Right? Yeah. August 10th. And um, so that may help us make some other decisions that we were, have been talking about. And um, in at least in the case of Carol, they're giving parents a choice, you know, traditional versus digital, virtual, whatever they call that. They're doing right? the same in Douglas. Okay, so so all that's going on. It's an interesting time. If you if you've not been coming in the city hall, it seems like every week just gets weirder and weirder. I don't know. It's the, you know we got the mask now, which makes it different. But we turned the place upside down and painted and carpeted it, and everybody's gotten back. We sort of have acclimated to that. We got this room done. Uh, one opportunity that we have now depending on what we do with recreation, is we could redo some recreational space for the same reason, right? It's sort of a once in a lifetime period of inactivity where we could we could do some things that won't be disruptive because, you know, maybe there's nothing to disrupt. Sad, but, you know, take advantage of the opportunity. So any questions on any of that? That's a lot of stuff. Road crew? What's the latest with our road crew? When yeah. do we see them coming back? They came Co back this morning. Um, okay. We had uh, we had a somebody come into work, felt bad, left Monday at lunchtime, tested positive. We sent everybody home. Uh, they stayed out for five and a half work days came back this morning so they skipped a whole week of most of Monday and then a whole week so they missed yesterday so they did Monday the Monday route today and they'll try to catch up but since then the the partner of the guy who tested who got sick and tested positive has also gotten sick and tested positive 
So that close proximity in the truck got him, right? They worked together. So as far as I know, nobody else has gotten ill, right? So we're, we're hoping that the other eight or so are all going to remain healthy. But they've only had it, – it's only been like eight days since, it, since potential exposure. So I guess there is still – you know, depending on whether it's five to seven day incubation or fourteen day incubation, I, mean, I don't. I guess Mr. Carter knows what it is. <laughs> he said it's five and a half to eleven days. That's what yeah, he's told us. We were quarantined for a while. I know. We were. Anyway, so we're glad to have them back. So you haven't tested the rest of the crew. The crew went to two locations where Stephanie. They they were all tested, but nobody's got results, right? Oh, yeah, only the second person that said, yeah, so we, ha we don't have results yet. You talk so soft, even when you pulled the mask down, we still couldn't hear you. In fact, I don't think it was any louder at all. Okay, go ahead. Are you finished? Taking questions. All right, any, any more questions for Tom? Okay, Tom mentioned the, uh, the safety grant, and I asked the chief if he would say a few words about the safety grant. Uh, so would you come up and, and talk about that just for a minute? The uh, safety grant is the GERMA grant that we apply for every year. Uh, we get equipment out of it and get uh, different things. Uh, our power DMS system is what we use in the city or in the PD to, uh, for training and, and things like that. So we pay for that out of it every year. The total of the grant is $10,000, uh, and we've gotten it for several years uh, now. Uh, and we have to do specific things to do that, including having a safety officer which is Sergeant Carroll. Uh, and so we get the power DMS system out of it uh, this year. Also some traffic barricades and cones that we can use along with the street department. And then we're uh, also getting a thermal night site. So like if somebody runs from us on, on foot at night or something, we can use that to help try to locate uh, those people. Okay, well that's good. I appreciate getting that every year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, we're getting right down to the end. Tom, will we have a ribbon cutting for the Gold Dust Park? I'm not planning to unless you want to. All right, we'll talk about it separate. I just, I, I knew that that had come up, but I didn't know if we'd ever made a decision on it. Okay, council, does anybody have any, anything else for tonight? Because we are close to adjournment. Avery, do you have anything? Nothing for me. Okay, Tom, nothing else? All right, with that, uh, I will ask everyone up here and those without your mask on to put your mask on to leave the building and I will adjourn the meeting. I'll Thank move you. to adjourn. Oh. <laughs> yes, this is an official meeting. You get used to those they, work they, sessions, don't you? I do. I do. Okay, so I've got a, a motion to adjourn and I have a second. All in favor? All right. It's, it's unanimous. And the chief even voted. <laughs>